I want to welcome everyone and thank you all for coming. One of the things I should stand. One of the things that I enjoy doing is local history. And I was telling uh, her that I finished a book called Mattapan Through Time this morning. So I was editing it, which is a neighborhood of the city of Boston. But last week I had finished a book on St. Michael's Episcopal Church in Milton. The and the week before that, I finished a book on Mission Hill Through Time. So since my retirement, which I had a financial career, I've been doing a lot of writing. Right now, in a lot of ways, my two major books are The Great Boston Fire of 1872 and a book on Milton Cemetery, which is celebrating its 350th anniversary this year. These are histories in some ways that the history is going to be lost if we don't record it. But many times, local history is always a very dry substance. And many times, without photographs, it's not very visually stimulating. What I try to do in my writing, as well as in my teaching, and I've taught at Boston University now for the last five years, in the Urban College of Boston for 25 years before that, is to make my courses interesting. And most of my students, which are sometimes traditional students, ages 18 to 22, but also include older students who have gone back to school to get their undergraduate degree, is something that I show in this instance of what Boston was like. And in one way, a course that's called Boston's Immigrants, I juxtapose 19th century immigration trends to 21st immigration trends and try to make the student think of how they might have acted 150 years ago. And in that vein, this one on the Boston Irish, which I finished last night, it's a brand new lecture that was asked for by the Austinville Village Library, is something that kind of shows the growth of the Irish in Boston from the period of the 1840s right through to the period of the 1960s. And in many ways, when we think of immigrants, to the United States, and many times we think of an agrarian grouping of people who have come in some ways to an urban center. And they adapt in many different ways, but one of them was, of course, the great equalizer was education. Education and politics were the two major features of the Irish in 19th and 20th century Boston. And Boston, which had started in 1630, would be a homogeneous town right through to the period of 1822 when it embraced a municipal form of government and became known as the city of Boston. Well, seen here, this is a painting of the Massachusetts State House at the head of State Street. It was painted in 1801, and it shows the town of Boston, which is actually built of wood. Now, on either side of State Street, we see both residences as well as the beginning of banks and financial institutions. In the distance on the left-hand side is the first church of Boston. But whereas it was built of wood, this was the man who would actually change it in a way, as we can do it. This was the man who would change Boston into a city built of red brick, and that was Charles Bullfinch. Bullfinch was a major man who not only was not an architect, but a gentleman's architect. He had been educated at Harvard. Um, I can't speak any louder, but I can see if I can do this. Can you hear this a little bit better? Okay, sorry. But Charles Bullfinch was graduated from Harvard College in 1784 and took the grand tour of Europe. When he returned three years later, he introduced a form of architecture known as neoclassicism. This was something that would transform the town of Boston into a multitude of different architectural styles. And the whole aspect was that Bullfinch himself, in some ways, would be that architect from 1795 until 1819 when he left for Washington, D.C. to complete the capital. But seen here in Boston, this map of 1814 shows Boston as an 800-acre peninsula projecting from the mainland by what was called the Neck. And the Neck connected Boston with Roxbury and what is today Washington Street in the South End that would later in the 1850s be enlarged. Boston had a population at this time of roughly 18,000 people. However, 90% were descendants of the Puritans that had settled the town 200 years before. But during the early part of the 19th century, Boston began to see change, and they began to embrace that change. And one of the many different types of change was religious tolerance. 
And seen here was the first place of worship for Roman Catholics in Boston. It was known as the Church of the Holy Cross, it would later in 1824 be elevated to the Cathedral of the Holy Cross, and it was on Federal Street in downtown Boston. On the right-hand side is Bullfinch's Tontine Crescent, built in 1795 as probably the most elegant row houses in all of New England, let alone Boston. And in the distance is the spire of the Federal Street Church, that when it moved to the Back Bay became known as the Arlington Street Church. This was the first instance of a difference in religion from Unitarianism and Congregationalism. And that aspect was not due to the Irish, but because of the French Revolution. And we would see in that instance, many French emigres coming to the New World, especially to Boston, where they would not only live, but also have a church of their own. But by the 1840s, Boston in some ways had a population of about 15% who were not native born residents. And one of the aspects was that many of them were coming from Ireland. Now, in my course at Boston University, I do teach the aspect that people came for a variety of reasons. Of course, there's war, there's famine, there's a multitude of different things. But the Irish in this instance were not only experiencing tremendous problems, but they saw successive destruction of the potato crop. And when one thinks of an Irish immigrant, this lithograph, which dated the 1840s, gives an idea of the type of a person who was immigrating to the new world. Well, in that instance, where they were coming from was a country which was still part of the British Empire, that where people not, did not own their land, but usually leased it from an English landlord. This photograph probably dates to the 1890s, and it shows the type of a house, in this instance, built of wood with not just a thatched roof, but straw bound with rope as something in some ways that they themselves could actually live in while they make maybe farm their 40 acres of land. On the left-hand side, you can see it's partly open to the air. And that was the fact that they didn't have to pay rent on that because it was open. They would usually keep animals there during the period. But by the period of 1845 and 1846, the potato blight was something that affected millions of people. Potatoes were very much part of the diet of the Irish. And seen here, many people themselves, though they had planted potatoes and hoped for a good crop, it would be destroyed. And here, the priest actually tries to console many of these people. But in the period of the late 1840s, it was so severe that many in Boston actually would send relief ships to Ireland. One of the major people that was involved in this relief effort was Robert Bennett Forbes. Forbes was a China trade merchant, and he had made three great fortunes, lost two, but he kept the third. And he was somebody who introduced Boston in some ways to the aspects of the China trade. So if I said to you, what would you think of when I said the word China trade? I'm sure you think of Nanking and Canton silks and all sorts of spices, but he made his money in opium. And in that way, Captain Robert Bennett Forbes did have what would have been considered a millionaire's income in the 1840s. Well, he rallied Boston merchants, and they would actually load a ship called the United States Jamestown. And seen here on March 28th of 1847, it set sail for Cork Island, laden not only with all sorts of preserved foodstuff, salted beef, as well as root vegetables, potatoes, and money that would actually contribute in some ways to the people not starving. Well, in this period of time, many people were coming to the New World. They couldn't basically stay on the land. And this is a print from the period of the late 1840s. It showed that many people were put off the land. If they had no potatoes to sell, they couldn't pay their rent. And the British landlords put people off their land when nowhere to possibly go. Some landlords were merciful and would actually pay the passage to the new world. Others basically saw them roaming from one county to the other. But in that period of the late 1840s, many of these prints, which shows outward bound, and this is the Quay of Dublin, would show people looking at signs and placards on walls. And it says that this was the Shamrock Line with American packets. 
They would come not just to New York, but also to Boston. This was the only salvation. And it was said that in the period of the 1840s with 3 million people in Ireland, 1 million people stayed, 1 million people died, and 1 million people emigrated. And in that way, in this print, we would see people, they couldn't walk to the waterfront, but they would take a train and they would actually say goodbye to family and friends, probably knowing that they would never see them again. This is an important feature because it shows the man in the foreground being hugged by obviously his mother and sister with all of the family wailing in the background. Well, the whole aspect of coming to the new world was something that was basically showing that many of these people were coming steerage on these huge clipper packets. And during the period of the 1840s through the 1860s, Donald McKay in East Boston was one of the major men who built these clipper ships, and they were basically to use in trade. But in the late 1840s, one man who actually had commissioned these ships was Enoch Train. Train was a well-to-do merchant in Boston, and each of his ships would have a large T seen here on the foremast. And this is Commercial Wharf at the foot of Hanover Street at Boston Harbor. Well, Donald McKay was also an immigrant living in East Boston. He had come from Nova Scotia. During the period of the 1830s, he was a shipbuilder in Newburyport, Massachusetts. But by the early 1840s, he had come to East Boston at the foot of Eagle Hill, where he had over 150 employees that built the largest clipper ships in the United States. In that instance, he not only built them for Cunard Line, but he also built them for Enoch Train. But Train was the man who actually wasn't born to wealth, so he knew hard work. In the 1820s and 1830s, he was a shipping broker. But by the early 1840s, he owned a packet of ships, upwards of 17, that would not only bring trade to Boston, but as we would see, immigration. Hundreds of people would come on these ships. It was their only salvation. And Enoch Train's prices were not inexpensive, but they were nowhere near as expensive as that of Cunard. And seen here, this was a packet brochure, and it says that Train and Company's line had not only the Star of the Empire, Charity of Fame, Staffordshire, the Daniel Webster, Parliament, North America, President, and Western Star, but these provided both first class as well as steerage coming to the New World and back to Europe. This was a major part of Boston's economy. You realize mercantile trade was something that usually many people invested in, but the maritime trade since the 18th century was one of the biggest things that profited Boston. And seen here off the coast of Boston, train ships would actually arrive on the average of one every week with upwards of 3,000 people on a ship it was built to hold 1,200 people. Now, Train was making a profit. Although many of these people had brought much of their own food because it wasn't provided, this could be anywhere from a seven to 10 week voyage. Now, many people think, as we see here, this is actually a grouping of people sitting on the deck. We see trunks, we see all sorts of lanterns, people just simply waiting seven to 10 weeks at the sea. But the more likely version is this one that showed thousands of people just getting a breath of fresh air. There was no privacy whatsoever. And it was that these would become known as coffin ships because of the close proximity of many of the passengers, cholera, typhus, and all sorts of diseases were rampant. And it was said that coming to the new world, an average of 15% of the passengers would die before they arrived in the new world. But what was the alternative? To stay in Ireland and die of famine or to take a chance and go to the new world? Well, they did arrive. Those that were fortunate enough would arrive at Constitution Wharf. Today, we think in the early 1900s of most immigrants coming to East Boston. But in this instance, it was the foot of Hanover Street, which was a diverse neighborhood by this period of time, which had once been in the 17th and 18th century, the home of the royal governors as well as wealthy merchants. 
But by the 1840s and 50s, it had become a neighborhood of mostly Irish immigrants. Now the family in the center are being greeted by their family that has already been here on the right-hand side. Now look on the right, you see the woman, a fashionable bonnet, just like every other woman was wearing, and he's wearing a top hat and a tailcoat. And you see the people who are labeled greenhorns simply because of their dress. And in this instance, we begin to see the first aspects of a civilization to the Americanization aspect. Now in that way, where did they go? Well, the North End had once been the home of well-to-do families. And this is Half Moon Place, a street that still exists. But on the right-hand side, what had once been a row house of a well-to-do family had now been subdivided with a family per room. In this instance, the North End, which was only four acres in size, was said to have over 80,000 people. And by the turn of the 20th century, had over 21 languages and close to 30 dialects that were spoken just in that neighborhood. Now, many people in some ways had to find a living. I said earlier that many of the immigrants that would come to the New World in the 19th century came from an agrarian culture. Many of them were farmers. Some people were fishermen. And seen here, this is a photograph from the 1880s that shows fishermen on T Wharf in Boston. The woman on the right-hand side is basically buying fish for the day, usually heads and tails. But this was a major feature. They had to provide a living, not just for themselves, but their families. They also had family in Ireland that many people wanted to bring to the new world. So this was a major force of contention. So here we have, in the 1850s, Boston's population increasing by leaps and bounds. Granted, it's partly matriculation, but it's predominantly immigration. And by 1865, one half of Boston, which was only 165,000 people, were either immigrants or the children of immigrants. And in some ways, whether they were fishermen or became domestic servants, this was the major feature for men and women. Employment was impossible in some ways to get outside of these things. Because by the 1850s, Boston had such a large population of immigrants that people began to become wary. They were taking jobs from the fishing trades. They were taking jobs from the servants. And seen here, this was a flag that said, Native Americans, beware of foreign influence. Well, foreign influence didn't necessarily mean that these people were, of course, immigrants, but it also meant that they had an allegiance to the Pope. Now, granted, the French had been in Boston and they built a church in 1804 designed by Charles Wolfinch, but they were only a few hundred. And by the 1850s, it was said that over 1,500 immigrants came every week to the Port of Boston. So this Native Americanism began to arise because, of course, people were losing their jobs to these immigrants. And they also had, in some ways, a new party. Today, we know the Democrats and the Republicans, which since the 19th century have been our two major parties, but they also had a party known as the Know Nothing Party. And the Know Nothing Party was headed up by this man, Governor Gardner of Milton, Massachusetts. He was a very well-to-do aristocratic merchant and tremendously wealthy, but he led a group of people that would have vouched him, Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, on the premise that they knew nothing. So whenever there was a blowing up of a Catholic church, destruction of a school, or of course, all sorts of stereotypical type of things, he said, I know nothing. And in that way, people began to arise. It says natives of the soil, meaning American citizens, arouse, shall American labor be protected against foreign competition in the home labor market. The watchword of Native Americans is foreign influence. Repeal the influx of foreign influence by repelling the influx of foreign immigrants. Protection against foreign competition in the home and labor market and a limitation of the area of slavery and the fugitive slave laws. Well, this was a major feature. Boston's voters, who at that time were only men, 
and men who owned property and paid a $2 a year poll tax, which was a considerable sum, it'd be about $20 today, were the people who actually were doing this. And we would see in some ways that newspapers, especially by a man named Thomas Nast, would create political cartoons of these new immigrants. Of course, it wasn't just the Irish, it was the Germans, it was the Jews, it was the Italians. And seen here, of course, of course, Irish are always stereotyped to enjoy a glass of whiskey. And seen here, not only did they look Irish, but after a few glasses of whiskey, they transformed into grotesque features. Thomas Nast was somebody who unfortunately created the Santa Claus that we know today, but he was also one of the most vile political cartoonists of the period, and he stereotyped immigrants. It said, Americans to the rescue, Irishmen under arms. They've got guns. Americans, sons of the revolution, a body of 75 Irishmen known as the Columbian Artillery have volunteered their services to shoot down the citizens of Boston, aided by a company of United States Marines, nearly all of whom are Irishmen, and now under the arm to defend Virginia in kidnapping a citizen of Massachusetts. Well, yes, they were members of the Columbian Artillery, and yes, they were armed, but they were a militia that would eventually serve in the Civil War, and very proudly. But because they were armed and because they were Irish, people seemed to perceive them as a threat. Not only were they taking their jobs, but now they had become a real threat. Well, Boston in this period became very bigoted and signs would go up not only in houses, but in newspapers. And it said, wanted a good, reliable woman to take care of a boy two years old in a small family in Brookline. Good wages and a permanent situation given. No washing or ironing will be required, but good recommendations as to character and capacity demanded. Positively, no Irish need apply. Well, help wanted, no Irish need apply. The stigma of not only the Roman Catholicism, but the stigma, of course, because they had taken the jobs of the working class Yankees was something that in this instance became something that was the fodder for the Know Nothing Party. And it would continue right through to the 1860s and early 1870s. A Boston seen here in a hot air balloon, and this was a balloon called the Queen of the Air, shows on the left-hand side the spire of the Old South Meeting House. And if one follows it down on a 45 degree angle, the crenellated tower of Trinity Church, on the site of what is today the former Filene's department store, we saw Boston as a population of 165,000. In the 1860s, not only had they infilled the South End, but they were beginning the infill of the Back Bay. And they were also annexing cities and towns surrounding the city. The city of Roxbury became part of Boston in 1868, the town of Dorchester in 1870. And in 1873, the city of Charlestown, the town of Brighton, including Alston, and the town of West Roxbury that included Jamaica Plain and Rosendale. So Boston was embracing change, immigration, as well as topographical changes, but it was also embracing change because by the 1860s, you now had immigrants who had been in Boston for 20 years, in this instance, Irish, but it could be any immigrant group, and within one generation, if they were native born, they had the vote. And the vote was really what transformed Boston. Seen here, of course, we realize that Thomas Nast himself was a nasty political cartoonist. So what are the two things that two immigrant groups enjoy? On the left-hand side, here's Mr. Irish Whiskey with his shillelagh above his head. And on the right-hand side is Mr. German Lager Beer. And what do they hold between them? A ballot box. Now, many times I tell people, including my students, always trying to get them to vote, the ballot or the vote is your voice. And you can actually change whatever the system is you wish to change by casting your vote. And in that way, in the 19th century, Many of the people who had become Americans, 
through the Americanization program, and their sons who were native born now had that vote. And the vote was something that began in some ways to make the new citizens of Boston stand up with pride. Now, granted, some of the cartoons might show a policeman, and many people knew that the police force was composed at least 80% of Irish by the 1890s. And here it has Officer O'Rourke in the fifth year as serving as a policeman. But look at his face. It's still the stigma of that stereotype of what an Irishman looks like. But it would change because in this instance, many times people began to realize that it wasn't just the Church of the Holy Cross, which became the Cathedral of the Holy Cross and would later move to the South End. Now Boston began to see the wholesale building of enormous palatial Roman Catholic places of worship. Immaculate Conception would be built and designed by Gridley J. Fox Bryant in Boston's South End, directly opposite the city hospital. You'd also have Boston College just down the street on Harrison Avenue, built to educate the first and second generation of the well-to-do Irish. Eventually, it would move to Chestnut Hill, and then this building would become Boston College High School, which prepared young men to enter Boston College. They also had the Kearney Hospital, endowed by Andrew Kearney, it was built on Pill Hill, or what basically we know of as Telegraph Hill in South Boston. But Andrew Kearney was actually an Irish immigrant. He was a tailor by trade with a man by the name of Jacob Sleeper, who endowed Sleeper Hall at Boston University. Andrew Kearney would endow Roman Catholic and Irish institutions, among them Kearney Hospital. You would also see the um, House of the Angel Guardian, which was on Huntington Avenue in the area of Mission Hill in Roxbury. This was a place for wayward women. Notice the wall that surrounds the property. <laughs> These women would usually be taught by nuns, not only a typical thing of education, but also to reform their lives. All of these institutions were an important part, but so too wasn't the new building of the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. Now remember, it was in downtown Boston, built in 1804. It remained there until 1867 when they purchased a piece of land on Washington Street in the South End. Patrick Keeley, not only an Irish architect, but one of the foremost Catholic architects in the country would build over 40 churches in and around the Boston area. And seen here, this was envisioned as the largest cathedral, not just in New England, but probably the entire United States. Though the spires were never completed, this was the intention, as you see. The land itself, because it was infilled, was totally insufficient to hold the weight of these enormous towers. So whether it was a church or a home or a place of education, by the 1870s, the Irish had had the ascendancy. And through that vote, they were able to begin to vote for somebody who was just like them. Now, here in Austinville, we might say to ourselves, who do we vote for? Well, maybe if he's blonde and blue-eyed, or she is, we might vote for them if we're blonde and blue-eyed, right? Well, the Irish voted for the Irish because who better to understand the plight of a first generation person from Ireland than a person who was also born in Ireland? Well, in 1879, this man named Hugh O'Brien ran for the mayoralship of Boston. He was born in Ireland, though his family had come here at the age of five. He would actually be educated in the public schools of Boston, but he was the Democrat candidate for the mayor of Boston, and he was elected. By 1880, you had a majority of the vote of Irish immigrants who had become citizens and Irish immigrants' children and grandchildren, men, who actually could now vote, and it was said that it was over 62 percent. The mayor was elected, and he was a very good mayor. He was not partial to any one grouping of people. But he spurred on this aspect of politics, just like the church. One could only hope that our son and daughter both become a priest and a nun. But in this instance, politics was a major way in the step up. 
By the early part of the 20th century, there was a man by the name of John Fitzgerald. And this is quite a nice portrait of him. He was the son of Irish immigrants and he lived in Boston's North End. And though he attended Boston Latin School, he was enrolled at the Harvard Medical School when his father died. He left school to take care of his younger brothers and sisters and at that point began to enter politics, running for alderman or what is today the city council of Boston. In that instance, by 1904, he was campaigning for the mayoralship of Boston. And seen here, it says for mayor, John F. Fitzgerald. The preliminaries are November 16th of 1904. And of course, people would vote from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. And quote, the people not the bosses should rule, unquote. In that instance, he was elected mayor of Boston. Do you know what the first thing he did was? He bought a house in Boston. <laughs> He'd lived in Acton, Massachusetts. But the surprising thing as a politician, he had to soothe people because he did have a brusque exterior. And one of the things that he sang was Sweet Adeline. And it was something that he did at every one of his campaign stops. This was a ballad and refrain that he did over and over until the day he died. But as I said, he would actually buy a house in Dorchester. In 1905, there was a perquisite that you had to live in the city of Boston if you were the mayor. <laughs> when he moved in from Acton, Massachusetts, he bought this house built in 1872 on Wells Avenue on Ashmont Hill, right near where I was raised. Our house would be right where I am. And in that instance, this was a magnificent house that actually survived until the 1950s. And there he actually lived with his family. Now, his long suffering wife, Mary Hannon Fitzgerald, is on the right hand side, and all of his daughters and sons surrounding him. And this is in their library at that large house. His family was a great asset because not only were they a loving family, but they were photographed in many different ways. Rose herself was enrolled at Dorchester High School, which was in Cobham Square. And in that instance, her father would give her her diploma in 1906, the year she graduated. But it was also the fact that there she courted a man by the name of Joseph Kennedy, also the son of a ward boss from East Boston, Massachusetts. Though her father had recently lost the election to a man named James Michael Curley, who became mayor of Boston, and we'll talk about him in a few minutes, they couldn't be married in a local church because of hecklers. So they were married in the private chapel of the um, Archbishop of Boston, Williams, which was actually at the South End Cathedral. Of course, during that period, Kennedy himself was the youngest president of any savings institution in the country. His company, Columbia Trust, was located in Maverick Square in East Boston, and it showed that this man who had prepared at the Boston Latin School and was graduated from Harvard University was an up and coming banker and financier. And he did quite well. And though he wasn't directly involved in politics, he would become the ambassador of the court of St. James. It's a great accolade, but it was also something that was unusual because he was a Roman Catholic. And serving as the ambassador from the United States to the court of St. James was a little bit askew. And of course, he didn't actually have a successful term of it. He returned to this country just after the war had been declared. But his family, like that of Honey Fitz's, was a major asset. And like Honey Fitz, he had a large family. In the very center is Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, and you see them here on either side with her father on the right, her husband on the left, and some of their children. The whole aspect was that within a period of just 70 years, many of these families had gone from immigrants now to among the leading citizens of Boston. And it was all because of politics. Seen here, I call this the triumvirate. Seen in the top, of course, is Honey Fitz on the left. The ambassador, Kennedy, directly above, and of course, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a melding of the two major ward boss families who would eventually go on to serve as representative, senator, and eventually president of the United States. When he cast his vote 
at what was the Old West um, branch of the Boston Public Library. It's now the Old West Church. He went with his grandfather and grandmother, Mary Hannon Fitzgerald and John F. Fitzgerald, to cast his ballot, and he was elected the representative from that ward. But he would also, as we see here, become president of the United States in 1963, something that many people didn't think would ever happen, simply because he was Roman Catholic. And here in the family's Hyannis Port House, they actually are photographed in some ways, and they've come the full circle from immigrants of the 1840s to 1963, when this fourth generation descendant of an immigrant becomes the president of the country. Well, the other man that I wanted to discuss is John um, Michael, James Michael Curley on the right-hand side. This is a photograph that shows these two people who were never cordial to one another. The Honey Fitz and James Michael Curley were at the, each other's throats throughout the period of the 1890s right through to the 1940s. In some ways, James Michael Curley, though, was just like Honey Fitz. He had actually worked his way up from Boston English High School, though he didn't attend college. And seen here in 1904, he ran for a position as alderman of the city of Boston, a member of the, what is today, the Boston City Council. He was successful from Roxbury, Massachusetts. But in that instance, he was also somebody within a short period of time, less than three years, was running for the mayor's position. Now, the mayor at that time was, of course, John Fitzgerald, the man who everybody knew because he sang Sweet Adelaide, and he was known as Honey Fitz because of the honey tones of his voice. Well, this was somebody who actually purported himself to be the mayor of the poor, and a humane, experienced leadership, so elect Curley. And it was something that worked because he actually threatened to out Honey Fitz, who was having an affair with a woman who basically was known as Sweet Adelaide. He stepped back, and at that point, Curley won the election. He served as not just mayor of Boston, but seen here, his placards would continue because he was reelected numerous times. And it says, for better business, for permanent jobs, for security for young and old, the Democratic James Michael Curley, a governor. Vote the entire ticket and come and hear this capable, courageous leader and discuss the present campaign. When he ran for the governorship, he was somebody who in some ways did quite well. But you might know the story. One of the terms that he elect was elected governor he was serving time in the penitentiary. <laughs> he had taken an exam for someone on a civil service exam and was caught and went to prison, but he said he would do it again. And in some ways, he was the mayor of the people of Boston, and he gave quarters to young children that he would see in the streets of the city, but he also gave a few dollars to a widow or to somebody who was down and out. The only thing he asked in return was your vote. And in that way, the vote transformed Boston's politics. So we began to see many of the descendants of the Yankees now giving up their row houses in the Back Bay and Beacon Hill and moving out to Milton, to Brookline, to Dover, to Westwood, no longer having anything to do with politics in Boston, but still maintaining close ties to things such as banking and insurance the symphony, the opera house, and of course, other cultural institutions. Well, here, Curley is seated in front of a sign that shows governor, character, courage, and Curley. And he did a very successful career. One of the things that he did was to build a house on the Jamaica Way in Jamaica Plain. Maybe you've driven past this house. It was always fun as a child to catch the shamrock shutters. They were the first things that he had put up to show the ascendancy of the Irish in this very Yankee bastion of Jamaica Plain. But this was a house that was built by many of his supporters. The interior fixtures came from a house that was being demolished in Providence, Rhode Island, that were given to him by a contractor. But the house was completely built on a man who was on a $5,000 a year salary. <laughs> And today, the house is conservatively worth about $3 million, and it's a museum. But Curley himself was somebody who didn't have just local ties, 
Remember, he was mayor of the city. He was governor of the Commonwealth, but he would also be a very close confidant of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And in the 1940s, this was a major feature because he would entrust Curley with some of the many things, such as the WPA projects, and of course, many of the other things to recover from the depression. But he also had a low license plate. Now, I knew somebody who was the grandson of the founder of Payne Weber, and he had license plates 315, 316, and 317. So when we would be driving, he would say, speed up, speed up, who is that? In whatever license plate was number seven or 10. Well, the whole aspect was that this was a license plate that he actually got from a family who could no longer afford to register the car. So the aspect of Nirvana was reached when you received this low license plate number. And look at him winking at you with five on his fingers. That number is still owned by one of his descendants today. Well, of course, he did an autobiography. I'd do it again. Remember when I said earlier that that was something that he had taken a civil service exam for a friend? Well, he would do it again, I'm sure. And he was beloved by these people. And in that instance, he was somebody who, as it says here, was one of the most impressive, influential, and irrepressive politicians of the 20th century America. And of course, I'm probably sure you too have a copy of this on your shelf, The Purple Shamrock, the Honorable James Michael Curley of Boston. He truly was a major politician. So between Honey Fitz and James Michael Curley, Boston politics had changed. But in that period, and there are a few that I'd like to just mention, people such as Dapper O'Neill were in the age old tradition of the Irish ward bosses. And he points to a photograph of James Michael Curley on his office wall at Boston City Hall. He was somebody who was brusque and usually said the wrong thing, but he was beloved by people in the city of Boston. Of course, there was also William Bulger who wrote a book called James Michael Curley. This was a short biography with personal reminiscences by Bulger. I use this in my course at Boston University and many students not only don't know who James Michael Curley was, let alone William Bulger, who was Speaker of the House of Representatives, later President of the University of Massachusetts. Many people don't realize that this man, though he's basically, again, a modern day ward boss, is fluent in both Greek and Latin, and is probably one of the best orators in and around the Boston area. But you realize in some ways there was also Ray Flynn and Ted Kennedy, these were politicians in some ways that were the legatees, so to speak, of the politicians starting with Hugh O'Brien in 1880. Politics was major business, but so too wasn't the aspect of a flower from Irish soil. This was a song that was done by Miles McCarthy. And as you can see on the lower right-hand side, you have a man dressed as he might have been, say for a wedding in Ireland, actually crossing the Atlantic Ocean the connection between the agrarian Ireland and the urbane, sophisticated city of Boston wasn't lost. And people began in some ways to long for that wonderful aspect. Well, eventually Boston would erect a statue, actually two, to James Michael Curley. One, he's standing and seen in the forefront. The other, he's sitting on a bench. Great photo opportunities. These are directly opposite what used to be Betty's Rolls Royce opposite Boston Faneuil Hall. But they also erected statues that were endowed by Tom Flatley, a billionaire man who lived in Milton, Massachusetts that created the Flatley Companies. And they two statues that are in the park at the corner of Washington and School Street, opposite the Old South Meeting House. And they show the Irish in 1847, here, famine coming to the new world, desolate and seeking a new life, and in 1947, as an up and coming, aspiring middle class family that has embraced the American ideal. And in that way, we realize that these two aspects are so important, but they realize that the Irish in Boston had come full circle from the 1840s of poverty, not only famine, but also immigration, to today, with probably many people in the Massachusetts area including a man named Anthony San Marco, who has 32% Irish blood, 
according to my heritage DNA, are people that look in some ways and act just like every other Americans. But we have a fine legacy that actually shows a resilience that goes the gamut of not just the vote, but also overcoming all odds. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it.